We're jumping in with some Wings of Glory Tactica World War One, And one of the things that I really enjoy about this game is that it is so easy to learn. So easy to learn, but very, very challenging to master. And there's some interesting crossover with some real world World War One type dogfighting and tactics that if you can pull into this game, the chances of winning will increase tremendously. And what I find challenging is it's such a fun game. You kind of want to go off on personal glory. You want to try and get as many kills as you can in pursuit of that glory, especially if you're playing a multiplayer game and it scales up so well. But in doing that, you risk the team. There's no I in team. And you do put yourself at tremendous risk if your opponent can pull off some very, very important Tactica. Now, I've been posting up a couple of other Tactica vlogs to my channel under the Wings of Glory playlist. And for that continuity, we're just going to touch on a couple of game mechanics to keep in mind and a very, very important starting core Tactica. A little bit of a recap to lay that foundation, which leads us then into this vlog, the idea of the bracket and why that is very, very important and increases your odds. So the first aspect of Wings of Glory is the airfield itself. Whether you're playing on one of the Wings of Glory mats or you have a custom wargaming table, the actual physical arena that you're going to fight in. And in this capacity, it is a fixed space game, which means, for the most part, unless you're playing custom missions or custom rules, if you fly off the table then you lose the game. That, that aircraft is not necessarily killed, but it's out of the game. You're down on cards, you're down on damage potential, and now you have one less plane. So staying on the table is important. Now, knowing this limitation, there's a duality in that if my plane is on the left side of the table, my left side of the table, I can't move to the left. So my opponent, as we program out our moves on the dashboard, on the pilot dashboard, you know with certainty I'm either going to be trying to loop back around, accelerate ahead, or move to the right. I'm not moving to the left. Likewise, at least for me, I know my opponent can't come from the left. So generally, what we want to do is try to really dominate the center of the table, because the center of the table gives us maximum maneuverability, maximum flexibility, where optimally speaking, optimally speaking, unless I'm on fire, I want to engage on my terms. If I can catch you, get on your tail. If I can catch you on the side, if I can stay out of your firing arc, assuming you have a front firing arc and not a tail gunner or something to that effect, then ideally I want to engage correctly when I have the advantage. And navigating in the center is going to give you that advantage. So I'm not saying don't go to the sides. By jousting and moving back and forth, you are going to find yourself there. But let's try and get out of that spot as quickly as we can. Now, second, never tell me the odds, but the odds of the game, the damage deck. Within there, there's a number of zeros, ones, twos, threes, pilot hit, engine hit, and the explosion. And the idea being in the game, if you're new to the game, when you take damage, depending on uh, the type of machine gun that's hitting you, you draw these cards from the deck. And as soon as they beat your hull, your hull points for each plane, the, the plane is destroyed. And if there's any special conditions, like an engine hit, or you're on fire, or a rudder jam, you, you take those hits. But you never announce to your opponent, oh, I took three hits, I took four hits. Because what it represents is the fact that they are shooting at you, you're up in the sky, you're moving around, I can tell I hit you, but to what extent did I really damage your plane? So it's possible to draw three or four cards and draw like one point of damage, zero, zero, one. You could be holding a whole hand of cards, but there's a lot of zeros in there. So what this means is at the beginning of the deck, at the beginning of the game, you can be a little bit more risky because the one card in there, that's the explosion. If you draw this card, it ruptures your fuel, ta fuel tank, you explode. Now, some Wings of Glory groups will take that card out because there's no coming back and it is a little disheartening early in the game to draw that card and you explode. 
Fritz, that'll never happen. Uh, it, it, it does. I mean, this is combat. These are the risks literally in a game. And it happened to me because I absolutely remember it. The plane that I was flying, I figure, okay, early on, let's, let's joust. Let's do this. And I take a hit. I draw the first card and it's the explosion and I just explode. Well, that happens. So you know what? Rack them up. Once we finish the game, we'll fight to the end. Knights of the sky. And then we will play again and I will try to get my revenge. But Math Hammer, tactically speaking, the odds of drawing that explosion are lower if the deck is full. Uh, What's that? Like Schroeder's cat, both alive and dead, based on quantum reality and quantum physics. Until you draw that explosion card, it's both at the top of the deck and the bottom of the deck. It depends on the observer in the moment without kind of going off in that tangent. But I'll gamble in the beginning. Now, I'm not saying to count cards... But as the deck gets smaller and smaller, if a plane isn't on fire, or it hasn't taken a pilot hit that you can see, or that explosion card is still in play, no one's drawn it yet, then we need to be a little bit more conservative. Those are two aspects of the rules. Now let's jump into the first core tactica that's important because it's going to lead to the second tactica we're looking at today, this idea of bracketing. Never leave your wingman. Always work in tandem. I have to say this for myself because, again, like I want to go off on glory. You could fight one-on-one. You pick a plane, I pick a plane, and we go head-to-head. Ideally, it should be two planes per player. And, And I say ideally because this pulls out some tactics. This gives a little bit of push and pull, and it creates some tension, some dynamic tension in the game. But I don't want to say that there's any right or wrong way to play. You could play with four planes. You could play with multiple planes. Uh, Generally speaking, depending on the number of players, if it's one or two players per side, we take two planes. As soon as we get into four, five, or six players, then we each take one plane and we work out ahead of time. We work out ahead of time. um, How are we going to Who's going to be whose wingman and how is we're going to play? Side, side, side note, house rule, just for the fun, just for the lulls, we're jumping into that history. So before we take off to the sky, the team, my teammates, I'm their teammate, we, we discuss like, okay, who's my wingman? Who are we going to go after? What are we going to do? We discuss it. But once we're in game and the planes are in the sky and we're programming our dashboard, you are only allowed to give hand signals. No, like, hey, you know what? Go on, Fritz. Take care of that. No, hand signals only because it represents the fact that we're up in the sky and all you have are those hand signals. So we have our wingman. The reason why you want to have this and do this is to maximize your firepower on the lead plane. If I don't have to worry about a plane behind me or if a plane comes up from behind me, that's the worst place to be in Wings of Glory, just on that tail, unless you have a, a... rear gunner or some other firing arc, but for most of the planes, the forward firing arc means if I can get behind you, then I'm going to be able to shoot at you and I can slow down a little bit and anticipate your turns. And even though I'm only hitting you with one card because I'm at the higher range, there's nothing you can do to shoot back at me. So that is the absolute ideal of where we want to be. Second to this, with having a wingman, that wingman can now at least drop back or at least move to engage. And this forces the plane on, on your tail, my tail, to make a decision. Don't engage. Keep on shooting at Fritz and potentially expose myself. Engage with that plane that's pulled off, the wingman. And now we got a dogfight there. Or the conservative approach, completely break off the attack and look to re-engage when things are favorable. So wingmen stay with them and move it so let's talk about the bracket and the idea behind the bracket is this works with squadrons or four planes and the reason why we went and led with wingmen is because you you can't really bracket if you don't have a wingman i mean you can but it potentially exposes that lead plane so i'm not saying don't do it with two planes but ideally two and two versus two and two so the idea of the bracket is if i have four planes flying at a target we always want to gang up on one target this is where those hand signals come into play we want to engage two three four to one i don't want to engage one to one i want to stack on as many possible planes as i can to the target plane 
I want to kind of bully that plane a little bit for two reasons. First, the maneuverability, not everyone is going to be able to pull off a shot every single time. That lead plane that you're going after is going to be able to shake off a few of those planes. So if I have four planes engaging your one plane, let's just say right off the bat, I've got three. Second to that, trying to stay in range, maneuverability, maybe that brings it down to two. Two on one means I'm dishing out lots of cards onto you. I want to overload those cards, so hopefully I'll hit you with threes and engine hits and pilot hits and maybe that explosion. And if you get to pull a lot of zeros, if I'm constantly ganging up on you with multiple planes, then at least you'll burn through all the zeros quickly and we'll get to the good damage parts. So ideally, we want to gang multiple planes. So we start, ideally, with the bracket. We're heading towards, we pick that one plane that we're going to target, that we're going to bully. And two planes are going to look to head straight towards the primary target. They're going to accelerate as slow as possible. So depending on the speed of your deck, depending on programming it out, we're going to look to move slow. The plan is to joust. The plan is to engage in the joust. And the way the joust works is we go head to head and we exchange fire. Or at the last second, right before we exchange fire, I break off. And then you don't have anything to shoot at. Joust is a little bit dangerous. But again, at the beginning of the game, lots of cards in the deck. That is the time to do it. While your two planes are moving slowly towards that primary target, that primary plane to joust, the other two planes, or, or squad members, if it's multiple planes, they're looking to bank left or right, accelerate as fast as they can, and drop in behind that lead plane. So now you are in the bracket, ideally, when you meet up in the center, requires a little finesse, you're getting hit from the front, you're getting hit from the back, and the idea being that they can't maneuver out of that bracket. You catch them in between both. This is not always easy to do. This is not always easy to do because in the game, you're judging speed. You're judging multiple players, plus other people are shooting at you, plus you might be the plane that everyone's ganging up on. There's a lot of what ifs, but by beginning to approach some of these fundamental World War I tactica, it translates over very well and very, very efficient to the game that once you stack over the core rules, like understanding the cards, understanding firing arcs, understanding programming the pilot console, and understanding the importance of dominating the center of the table, that will put you in that higher wing bracket.